The realistic history of our school is not easy to be understood, to be told, or to be fully traced back. If we hold our history as we are told internally, side by side with the history of Japan, many things will fit, many passages will be controversial, and for others, the Occam's razor, that is, the simplest hypothesis with the fewest assumptions, will not be on our side. To complicate things even more, even further, some masters from the previous generations were very proud of our own lineage and history, and uh, that could make some of them somewhat close to pieces of information um, if they interpreted that it could hit against our roots. However, as we will see, this is not particular to our tradition. All these characteristics I have just mentioned are characteristics of the very early history of Japan. In this case, it is safe to say that there is a huge gap of cultural and historical reliable information that applies to many people like our predecessors in our tradition, and not just ourselves. The first book of history of Japan was written by the 18th century, known as Kojiki, at request of Empress Genmei. The Kojiki was published in three volumes, uh, they can be translated as a record of ancient matters. The second book about history of Japan was the Nihon Shoki. These two books together bring myths that are part of the inspiration behind many ascetic practices and purification rituals. History of Japan before that, in general lines, was not really documented. But differences and disagreements are not uncommon, and we really can't know for sure historical scenario um, before 17th century. All we have are clues, are leads, and these leads do constantly change as new discoveries are brought forth. As a matter of fact, it is extremely difficult to have a historical ground on prehistory and later stages until much, much later, close to 18th century in Japan. From this perspective, I would like to share a bit of knowledge that is part of the education of a student in our school, mainly learned through the Sampaiko High relationship along the years, concerning the historical and ethnic perspective of our people, mixed with some findings of scholars that have done a great work in their fields. And uh, those findings come along with many aspects of our tradition as we learn. So, we'll probably bump on geopolitics, uh, maybe review an outline or another of ancient warfare strategies, and surely walk on a loose and sensitive historical ground. I invite you uh, to take a closer look in the scenario of the early history of Japan and get in touch with a few of the people related to it. Um, it is important to note that up to this current generation there was no written document of our history in our school. And uh, this is somewhat consistent um, with uh, all the other people and tribes who lived supposedly in the same historical time than the Chizen people did. Actually, if we look towards the Auroch people, for example, the main guide for their origins since centuries ago up to current date is their Auroch tradition. Ethnographic fieldwork of Lev Strandberg, for example, um, on the Niviks, the Aurochs, and the Ainu people showed how these people influenced themselves and influenced others. So imagine we are talking about a people that existed um, some about and some over a thousand years ago. Aurochs have no written language, neither do I know people. So think about um, how much, you know, so much has been lost and uh, much of what survived is actually to be found uh, in the oral traditions. Um, it is the first time in history that our school is doing a huge effort to document our origins, our roots, and the knowledge um, found in the, in the Shizen tradition. Before that, as usual, knowledge was passed in an oral tradition from master to student. And, uh, well, we know that 
even the most diligent master and student at some point will somehow change a part of that information that got to them, um, that got to that student eventually, um, even from uh, interpreting his own way and uh, adapting from one generation to another to the current needs, well, as a natural course of human nature. It is widely known that much of history, if not all of it, is told by winners. In case of Japan, the Yamato people, or the Yamato Minzoku, were the dominant native ethnic group of Japan. So this name came to be used around the 19th century to distinguish those who lived in the mainland of Japan, that is Honshu, from other ethnic groups, the minority, that lived in the peripheral areas of Japan. So amongst these groups, we could find Koreans, Taiwanese Aborigines, Oroch people, Nivik people, the Ryukyuan people, and yet others, many others for sure. It is widely accepted that the Ainu were the real first Aborigine of Japan, the first natives. There is no definite theory or answer as to where the Ainu came from. What is clear is that at some point, they have lived in Hokkaido and the parts of the Russian Far East, um, that area just about the disputed Kuril Islands and the southern Sakhalin Island for hundreds of years. It is suggested that they had Caucasian traces. I have heard this, this theory many times. Um, but some, some scientists have recently discovered that the Ainu and the Ryukuan and the Jomon people um, carried a genetic marker that is shared by the Mongolite populations. So it is a general picture that they had lighter skin, they were shorter than the Japanese, um, and had more hair over their body. Their communities and traditions were eroded by waves of Japanese settlement and subsequent assimilation policies. About the early conquerors of Japan, the most accepted version, short in a very long story full of details, were nomadic uh, tribes moving from the Altai Mountains through Asia and immigrating to Japan. Um, it brings us to the Yamato dynasty, later leading to the Imperial House of Japan. From archaeological remains found all over the Kibi region, in the same area as Okayama Prefecture, the invaders who conquered the Yamatai clearly came from Korea and uh, ancestral links can be traced back to Central Asia thus suggesting their route along with many other evidences. Researchers like uh, Michael Gorman in his study The Quest for Kibi shows many interesting historical links about that. Active contact between the Wajin, the ethnically Japanese, and the Ainu of Ezochi, now known as Hokkaido, began in the 13th century. It is curious to note that for some scholars it was in the 19th century the Japanese people called the northern island of Hokkaido Ezochi, that meant land of the Ainu, as a reference to the, the fair-skinned and long-haired people who had lived there for hundreds of years. Now, as we have seen, it actually represents the northern part of um, the Meiji era Japan, especially Hokkaido, but also Sakhalin and the Kuru Islands. Now, a curious fact is that this is the kanji for Ezochi, as you can see. Although it usually refers to the Ainu, the kanji in the center is the kanji for Emishi. That was another people of the type of that time, another tribe. Um, particularly since the Yamato rule and uh, a long time, none of these lineages, the, o the Oroks, the Ainu, the Emishi, and others had any kind of support or even allowance to be on their lands in Japan, on their own lands. Now, imagine that it was only after court cases in late 50s, I mean 1950s, that Yoroks were recognized as Japanese nationals and thus permitted to migrate back to Japan, mainly from Russia. According to Michael Weiner, um, uh, most settled around Hokkaido. It was in 1975 that the Ulita Kyokai of Japan was founded for a fight for their rights and the preservations of their traditions. 
about the Ainu people on the other hand is even more astonishing. It was only on um, 2008 that resolution was approved by the Japanese Diet calling upon the government to recognize the Ainu people as indigenous to Japan and urging an end to discrimination against the group. The resolution um, recognized the Ainu people as indigenous people with a distinct language, religion and culture and uh, rescinded the, the 1899 law. So, this got to many medias, even on, on BBC. This law I've just mentioned was more of an act which labeled the Ainu former aborigines. The idea was that they would just somehow assimilate. This decision stood for almost a hundred years and successive governments held that there was no Ainu issue and insisted that Japan did not have any ethnic minority groups. So sadly, since Yamato ruled, and up to this point, Aino culture was not seen as something to be celebrated or preserved. Um, so many grew up ignorant or ashamed of their own cultural heritage. And there's also the issue, the international issue of the Kuril Islands. Both Russia and Japan claim them, but the Aino were the original in inhabitants and uh, they, they obviously do know it. So, as you can see, the early history of Japan sometimes is very controversial. Regarding the process of populating this country, the superimposition of cultures, the annihilation of many rich cultures uh, along history. It is not known for sure, for example, even the precise etymological origins of the word Yamato. It is unknown how many Ainu people yet live, and existing numbers show with great discrepancies, mainly due to ethnic issues in Japan. And there are many dialects in Ainu language. Actually, Ainu language is considered to be a language family spoken at north of Japan, and those dialects, for making things even more complicated, are not mutually intelligible. And something alike happens to the Amishi people. Once again, none of us can know for sure their origins, neither uh, any original date for them. It is thought that uh, they have been related at some point to the Ainu people. Now we do know that some Emishi tribes resisted the rule of the Japanese emperors during the late Nara and the early Heian periods. Um, that goes from the 7th to the 10th centuries common era. We also know that their language is different from Japanese, which scholars so far have been unable to reconstruct. Some curiosities about the Amishi people are that they had a unique style of warfare, um, in which horse archery and hit and run tactics represented a very effective way of fighting against the Japanese Imperial Army of that time. Um, this last one mostly relied on heavy infantry and were definitely slower. There are notices published from Harvard University Press that the Imperial Armies uh, which were modeled after the mainland Chinese armies were no match for the guerrilla tactics of Emishi. Mutual influence was inevitable. In order to advance up the Kumano River, the Yamato tribes found guidance from local tribes. Uh, according to Rod Nutsen, the totem of those tribes was the Atakarasu, and they found many cultic symbols along their way and um, the years to come. Now, there's a great number of examples we could uh, discuss showing how mutual influence between all these groups happen. One of them is found in our Komyuchi, in our own Komyuchi, from our school. The early Komyuchi we study serves as a base and um, a characterizing ground for other Komyuchi studies and kata that come later on. We have seen and heard from masters, researchers in our own school that the origin of our Komyuchi and grappling techniques is in Mongolian arts of fighting. Now, Don Dreger, a noted researcher of Bugay, observed that grappling methods used for combat are as old as men on the Asian continent, and this is no less true in Japan. Japanese mythology uh, re recounts 
uh, grappling techniques, grappling combats, between deities to um, determine divine authority for leadership on the land. Now he continues that it wasn't until in 9th century um, common era that primitive grappling methods came under the purview of the warrior class. So contrary to common belief, it is clear that there is no way that the samurai at their time of existence created the first grappling methods. There is no way this could have happened. Um, what we can say is that much later on, particularly in Sengoku Jidai, around 1600, the samurai had the jujutsu already consolidated um, as their self-defense art, mostly used in, in everyday situations. And that jujutsu was greatly influenced by those first grappling methods. Now, there are other angles and many, many more evidences that indicate that grappling techniques came from Asia much before the existence of the samurai class, but it's worth highlighting it anyway. Now, in Shizen culture, regionally, we had just one great taijutsu art. We do compare it to jujutsu, but just for the ease of comparison and reference. It was established not as today jujutsu at all, um, even, or, or even if you consider our own jujutsu. Now, they aimed at grappling and breaking bonds, either using rustic leverages and locks, or either smashing, many times using rocks and pieces of hard material um, on their hands. And um, uh, there were no projections, you know, not even close to what we see in Jujutsu nowadays. And uh, when they threw someone, they would attempt to make the enemy hit the head on the ground, always violently. Aikijujutsu Jujutsu that obviously was far from being consolidated as a definite Jutsu itself had a resembling set of principles and movements at that time. Now it's very important to highlight that Minamotsu no Yoshimitsu uh, is credited as the progenitor of Daitoryu Aiki Jujutsu. He started the development and the consolidation in a single Jutsu of techniques that already existed in many clans and families. It was not something brand new at all. So, in our early tradition, but later on at some point, the techniques, or say the subset, alike Aikiju Jutsu principles were called Suipo, or the method of the water, and was part of Koto, the small war. Well, at that point, Suipo was used by elder, elder masters, because um, Elder Masters would, um, what can I say, they would lock up um, warriors in positions that they couldn't move. And the younger uh, warriors thought that it was some kind of magic until, uh, until they got to study it. They would say it was a new form of Taijutsu, or say Jujutsu for understanding, because Taijutsu of that time um, demanded physical power, and the elder ones couldn't anymore. Something else quite interesting are the techniques with ropes in Chizen culture. Apart from the Hojo Jutsu forms that are studied and also their usage in Torite, this last one, you know, as a subset of Jujutsu for arresting people, um, the Koshinawa, the rope used around the waist, and some forms of Hayanawa, usually some a small rope, um, later the Sagyo and other forms that are very different from all other samurai ways of using ropes, um, at least that we have seen, and uh, there are no knots on the enemy. And besides that, many of those techniques were performed originally with lianas, that is much within a, a tribe's resources. Mr. Gregor's observation that grappling with the, the spirits was not purely Japanese illustrates the point made by a number of historians and anthropologists that there were several influences in the ancient development of Japan, from India through China, from China itself, Polynesia and Central Asia. Now, another curious example of religious influence, let's say entangling in this case the Yamato and uh, local isolated tribes. Even at very ancient times, some of those passages got registered. The Hayato, um, literally meaning the falcon man, 
where people of ancient Japan believed to have lived in the Osumi and Hyuga region, the south of Kyushu, quite south of Japan, nowadays Miyazaki Ken. Hayato, as well as uh, Kumaso people, lived in Kyushu long before recorded history. Um, they, uh, they were the indigenous people of Kyushu, and uh, contrary to what is to be found in some medias and many websites, at least from a current scientific point of view, there is absolutely no evidence to prove um, a Malay or a Polynesian ancestry to the Hayato and the Kumaso people. There is plenty of evidence, on the other hand, to show that they were native to Japan and genetically related to the rest of Japan, except the Ainu and the Ryukyu people of Okinawa. Scholars tell us that Hayato tribal guardians, amongst other ritual obligations, protected the Yamato high chieftains and later the imperial rulers in their palaces. One of their many manifestations were donning masks according to their own beliefs um, and making continuous sounds as barking when they were escorting and protecting their masters physically and spiritually. Like many other people, they had their own culture, their own way to approach life, death, rituals, passages, spirituality. They had funerary songs and performed funerary dances. And there are many references to their actions and sometimes their rebellions in the chronicles of Japan. It is indeed clear from a number of notices that the rulers considered the Hayato as being partly in the physical and partly in the spiritual world. And about that, from an anthropological perspective, in simple words, what characterizes a culture is everything that sets, puts forward um, and promotes the identity of that people. Amongst those um, are the spiritual, not religious, however, questions, the ones that set the most our culture, and the warfare has always been very significant as well. Another curious cultural fact came to mind. At those early times when a male child was born, um, in our tradition they would throw him inside a tank of water. If he struggled against water, he would study the arts of war, you know, uh, he would study the warfare and become a warrior. Now, on the other hand, if he accepted that and just drowned, he would go study the spiritual matters of our tradition and become a shaman or a wizard of that time. Let's emphasize one more time that what we have done here is just a reflection about historical perspectives. The idea is not to think that what we have discussed here refers to any kind of truth written in stone. Many things that we just saw here may tomorrow change or we may find some more complete version or some more complete research. The idea behind this conversation is to take a look, a glance, about how many people, how much culture has never come public and has never been exposed before. Thank you very much.